The following reading is from a book called The Signs and Causes of Melancholy with directions suited to the cases of those who are afflicted with it, collected out of the works of the Reverend Mr. Richard Baxter, for the sake of those who are wounded in spirit, by Samuel Clifford, Minister of the Gospel, originally collected in 1749. The Epistle Recommendatory the subject of this treatise, and the manner in which things are laid together in it, is such as will render it of standing service to many in the world. There are few that become real Christians, but at one time or other are exercised with something of that melancholy which is here described. And we believe there are none that have chosen to be the companions of them that fear God, who do not meet with it in the cases of others, however free from it they are in themselves. Where it prevails to a high degree, tis one of the most deplorable cases in the world, and even the least degree of it requires good help and some pains to get rid of it. Such a book as this, therefore, must be greatly valuable to those who are either afflicted with melancholy themselves, or desirous to relieve and assist others under such a disorder. There is not anywhere yet published that we know of so full and distinct and orderly a consideration of this case is in the following collection. We need not say anything of the author from whose writings this collection is made, since we have it already as a concurrent sentiment of 34 pastors who have all subscribed a recommendation of Baxter's practical works, that the things treated on are most accurately handled and at the same time with greatest plainness suited to the meanest capacities and pressed home upon the consciences of readers with inimitable life and fervor. Only this much we must add in favor of the collector of the following sheets that he has acted with so much care in transcribing Mr. Baxter's thoughts, keeping to his words and disposing all with so much judgment into the method and order in which they now lie is to render the aforementioned excellencies of Mr. Baxter's writings, namely their accuracy, plainness, and inimitable fervor, more serviceable to common readers than before. Now may that God who comforts those that are cast down make this book useful to such an end, and where it is so, let none of us be forgotten in your prayers. Samuel Wright To the Reader they who have been strangers to melancholy in themselves or others may be ready to ridicule those who shall complain thereof. But they who by woeful experience have known what it is to be melancholy themselves, or conversed with those who have been afflicted with it, both which has been my own case, were readily acknowledged the case of persons under such circumstances to be sad and very affecting. There is especially who have no friend at hand to give them suitable advice by speaking a word in season to them, in compassion to such distressed souls who are weary and heavy laden and ready to sink under their burden i have drawn up the following collection which i submit to the censor of those whose abilities render them more capable or whose condition is such as to render them more immediately concerned to judge of its usefulness by the application thereof to themselves as for the reverend author multitudes of melancholy persons of all sorts learned and unlearned rich and poor, for many years together, made their continual application to him for advice, which gave him an opportunity to be thoroughly acquainted with their various cases. And this, together with his great abilities, rendered him capable of giving directions suitable to the conditions of persons under such sad circumstances. And indeed what he said upon that head seems to so full and to the purpose that it would be idle and impertinent in me to pretend to add anything to it by way of supplement. But having nowhere in his works, as I have observed, given any directions to those who were once oppressed with melancholy, but are now delivered from it, I shall take the liberty to add a few things by way of advice to such. Number one, keep your distance from sin. Tis evil in itself, as it is a manifest contempt of the authority of the great and dreadful God, and so evil in its effects, that was it not for the merits of Christ and the pardoning mercy of God? Eternal death would be the unavoidable consequent of every sin. But when in your distressed condition you thought of sin and death, and sin and hell together, how evil did it appear in your eyes? And though time has made a great alteration in your state and condition from what it was, it has made no alteration at all in the nature of sin, but that it is a transgression of the law of God, and therefore is evil in the sight, and should be as hateful to you as ever it was. 
You have the word of God to be a lamp under your feet and a light under your paths. Acquaint yourselves with it, that you may know what your duty towards God and man is. And though you will daily sin against God by your omissions and commissions, for there is not a just man upon earth that does good and sins not, yet allow not yourselves in the willful omission of any duty which God requires, or in the practice of any known sin which he forbids. Such things as these are inconsistent with the nature and sincerity of repentance, and altogether unbecoming those who have professed such sorrow for sin as you have done, through a sense of guilt which you had contracted, and that punishment you had deserved by it. Remember God's propriety in you, which gives him an absolute sovereignty and dominion over you, and consequently a right to impose laws on you, and exact duty and obedience from you, and beware of being guilty of anything that looks like rebellion against him. Let not the baits of profit or pleasure draw you to sin, seeing the pains of hell will be the punishment of one, and the loss of the soul so far necessarily follow upon the other, that nothing but the pardoning mercy of God upon your repentance can prevent it. Nor let the evil example of others ever be a snare to you. It is the signification of God's will revealed in his word, which is rule of his government now, and will be the rule of his judgment at the last day, and should be the rule of our lives and actions, in order to your preparation for it. Get right apprehensions of the evil of sin, which may be done by a due consideration of the majesty of God against whom it is committed, and the nature of that punishment which awaits it in this world, and is reserved for it in that which is to come. Be sensible where you have suffered most, and where your greatest danger lies from sin, and there look the better to yourselves. Call upon heaven for help. Double your watch and stand upon your guard as those who have an enemy always at hand to make his to make his onsets upon you. And it would be necessary for you to avoid the occasions of sin, as you would desire to be kept from sin itself. For while you are familiar with the one, you cannot be secure from the other. Time was, it may be, when you were guilty of overdoing in this manner, while you thought some things duties which God never enjoined, and some things sins which he never did forbid, and stood at too great a distance from that which you thought to be sin for fear of offending God. But the Apostle's advice, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil, is necessary for all times and for all persons, those especially who have had such dreadful apprehensions of the wrath of God for sin upon their spirits as you have had. And may what I have felt of that nature, may you say, be a warning to me forever to beware of sin. What convictions have I been under of the evil of sin, when God seemed to enlarge the capacity of my soul? that I might be more sensible of the severity of his displeasure against sin, and my own awakened conscience set all my sins in order before me in a terrible and amazing manner. What agonies of soul have I been in, through apprehensions of the wrath of an offended God, to be inflicted upon me for my sins? I have been, as it were, within a sight of the bottomless pit, in view of that lake which burns with fire and brimstone, while I have had a hell of horror in my own conscience, upon sense of the horrid evil of sin and God's displeasure against me for it. With what brokenness of heart did I confess and bewail my sins before God, and with what earnestness did I pray for mercy myself and desire others to pray for me? And did God hear and answer my prayers and their prayers for this, that I should sin against him? I have been as a brand plucked out of the burning, and I will never forget the mercy, nor contemn the authority of my deliverer. And you who have hitherto been merciful to me, even beyond my expectation, leave me not at last to the power of my corruptions. Thou who knowest all things, dost know that sin is a burden to me, and that I must not be discharged from it while I live in this lower world. Help me daily to repent of my sins, and the Lord in mercy forgive them, and let your grace be sufficient for me to enable me to carry on the conflict with my corruptions so effectually that though sin has a being in me, it may not have dominion over me. Number two, look upon the devil as your implacable enemy and resist his temptations. Having by sin forfeited f forever lost the happiness which he once enjoyed, he envies yours, and if it lies in him to effect it, you shall be as miserable as himself. Be not ignorant of his devices. Keep far enough out of harm's way. While you pray to God, not to lead you into temptation. Don't cast yourselves upon temptations. The devil will show you the bait and conceal the hook. But can he prevail with you first to look upon and then to play with the bait? 
you may before you are aware be taken with the hook. This is the method he took with thee, first to question the truth of God, next to look upon the forbidden object, and then to take and eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree. The devil's carriage towards you will tell you, beyond all exception, what an enemy he is to you, an enemy to body and soul, to your good in this world, and also in that which is to come. You have felt it by sad experience when you were continually assaulted with his horrid temptations, so that for you to question it would be altogether as absurd as to question whether it is dark at midnight or light at noonday. As you fear God or love yourselves, put on the whole armor of God. Stand to your spiritual arms and stand your ground against the enemy of your salvation. Reflect on the malice and enmity which he expressed towards you when he hurried his fiery darts with such hellish rage and fury into you, and let this teach you to proclaim and carry on a perpetual war against him. Number three, carefully avoid what may occasion the return of your former affliction. That which has been may be again. A burnt child dreads the fire. I need not tell you that it is no desirable condition to be haunted by the devil's blasphemous suggestions, or to lie under the terrors of an awakened conscience accusing for sin. The sharpest bodily pains are short of the anguish of the soul and easier to be borne. When you consider how it was with you when it was your case, when you had apprehensions of death and the wrath of God upon your spirit together, when you looked upon yourselves utterly forsaken of God as the devils are, the thoughts of these things, when your thoughts were always upon them, made you a terror to yourselves, weary to live and afraid to die. The anguish of your spirits is inexpressible. You would not be in the like condition again for a world. If so, prudently forbear and prevent what may bring you into it. Was it formerly occasioned by an ill habit of body? Use proper means and time to remove the cause which has produced such sad effects. Or did the sorrow of the world by losses and disappointments from thence bring it upon you? Labor to love God more and to place your chief good in the enjoyment of his love and to get above the love of these earthly things and disappointments from them may not interrupt your peace with God nor the peace of your own minds and consequently have an influence upon you to reduce and bring you back again to the deplorable condition which you were sometimes in. Particularly, I would advise you whenever troubles do arise in your minds and melancholy thoughts make any long stay or fixed impression there that you would acquaint some friend therewith which may be a means to prevent many a sin and much after sorrow. To much secrecies, Samuel Bolton observes in his Instructions for Afflicted Consciences, page 583, and concealment may cause the wound of a terrified conscience to bleed inward, wrinkle, fester, and grow desperate, whereas seasonable discovery might have cured and comforted it. I have known him who did bite in and keep close in his bosom the temptation of blasphemy, the space of above twenty years, all which time the devil did tyrannize extremely and did keep him almost in continual terror. He thought there was never man had such vile and prodigious thoughts as he, and if he would know what they were, he would be abhorred as a monster of men and the loathsomest creature upon earth, and most worthy to be rooted out of the society of mankind. And hereupon many and many a time, when he apprehended any opportunity, or had any means offered to make himself away, he was tempted thereunto, principally upon this ground, that it was pity such a horrible blasphemer, for so he is supposed, should any longer breathe. But at last, hearing the nature, manner, and remedy of those hideous injections discovered by the ministry, afterward privately informing himself further, and more fully from God's messenger, was happily taken off the rack for the time to come, and most wonderfully refreshed. Number 4. Magnify the mercy of God towards you, in bringing you out of your sad, dark, and disconsolate condition. What a case were you in when the devil assaulted you with his horrid temptations, and followed you with them? one after another, so that no sinner was won over, but another immediately followed upon it. I need not tell you how he sometimes tempted you to blaspheme God, sometimes to despair of mercy, as persons utterly left and forsaken of God, and cast off forever, and sometimes to destroy yourselves. What a case were you in when you could see nothing, hear nothing, speak of nothing, or think of nothing, but the devil would immediately give it a blasphemous turn in your minds against God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures, and so on. 
and so hideous a manner as that the agonies of your souls did cause your very bodies to sweat again. What a condition were you in when through the prevalency of your distemper and the devil's temptations you made an absolute surrender of yourselves to the devil and seemed satisfied in what you had done. You wished yourselves in hell that you might know the worst of your condition. But a merciful God had more compassion on you than to say it should be unto you according to your distempered desires. What a case were you in when to think of the mercy of God, the merits of Christ, or the happiness of heaven, to strike you like so many daggers to the heart because you thought you had no part in either of these. But when you reflected upon the wrath of God, incensed by sin and the miseries of hell, which the devil did frequently set before you, the renewed thoughts of this caused your hearts, as it were, to die within you, and the more because you were to suffer in the one, and lie under the dreadful effects of the other to all eternity. Can you think upon these things, and not magnify the mercy of God towards you? Time was, may you say, when I thought no person in the world was even in the like deplorable case with myself, and that it would never be otherwise with me. I looked upon myself as a castaway, as a vessel of wrath, fitted for destruction. I looked upon myself as an heir of hell, and felt an hell of horror in my conscience, and apprehended it to be some drops of that wrath which was to be forever pouring down upon me. But God was merciful to me, not only beyond my deserts, but altogether beyond my expectation too. When it was midnight with my soul, and I verily thought that blackness of darkness was reserved for me, when I awakened in darkness and saw no light, then did God shine into my soul, by reading such a passage of scripture and other books which God directed me to, by hearing such expressions in public from ministers or in private from friends, it pleased God at first to let some light into my dark soul and to increase it more and more till I who walked in darkness and saw no light have now hopes to be one among the number of those who shall dwell in the regions of glorious light even in the presence of God, where there is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. Let the present age and generations to come magnify the mercy of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all is within me. Magnify his holy name. Come you who have been in the like circumstances with me. Let us speak of the great and wonderful things which God has done for us, and excite one another with thankful hearts to exalt his name together. We who have tasted that the Lord is gracious in such a signal manner must be some of the most ungrateful wretches in the world to forget what God has done for us and to deny him his due praises. Number 5. Live becoming the mercies that you have received. What great things has the Lord done for you? He has saved you from hell when in your own apprehension you were on the very confines of that lake which burns with fire and brimstone and restored unto the joy of his salvation and the light of his countenance who did not only go mourning all the day long for want of it, but utterly despaired of ever enjoying it. Let what God has done for you be looked upon not only as an obligation to thankfulness, but also as the greatest engagement to duty and obedience. Love God. It is what his goodness in himself and his goodness to you does loudly call for, and show your love and obedience to his commands. Take heed of growing remiss in your duty towards him, or growing bold with the occasions of sin. Can you reflect on the anguish that your souls have been in, upon the account of sin, such as you cannot express, nor others who were never in the like circumstances conceive, and ever have favorable thoughts of sin? Why has God dispelled your doubts and fears, and freed you from those dismal apprehensions of his wrath and displeasure, which you were sometimes under, but that you should serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life? Or remember that it is not for you to live as the vain ones in the world do, who were never under such apprehensions of the evil of sin as you have been, nor ever experienced that the Lord is gracious as you have done. Say therefore with yourselves, May I live the mercies I have received by living to the praise and glory of that God, who has dealt so mercifully with me. Let me never be weary of his work and service, or by sin depart from him. It was he who helped me in a time of need, when all failed me. God did not leave me nor forsake me. Let me do with readiness what God does require of me, and labor to live so as that I may show forth the praises of him, who has called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. While others make light of sin, may I, as I do fear God or love myself, be afraid of it, especially considering the dreadful agonies of soul which I have been under, through apprehensions of the wrath of God to be inflicted upon me for it. While others dispute the equity and reasonableness of God's commands, 
Say of one duty it is too costly, and of another it is too difficult. Let it be the language of my soul. Speak, Lord, and thy servant will hear. And let me think nothing too much to do for the honor of that God who has done such great things for me. Number six, look upon the things of this world as vanity, and take heed you do not overlove them. This world is not your home. It is but your passage to another. These earthly things are not the best things, nor does the least part of your happiness consist in the enjoyment of them. They cannot commend you to God while you live. They will afford you no comfort when you shall come to die. And when your souls have left your bodies and are gone into another world, all these things will be of no signification to you. The enjoyment of these things in the greatest abundance will not denominate you happy, nor the want of them speak you to be miserable. Men may respect the rich more than the poor, but God does regard the one no more than the other. Whence it follows that those earthly things are neither so valuable nor so formidable as many do imagine them to be. And you may say, of all persons in the world, I have no reason to overlove these things, having paid so dear for it already. It was the sorrow of the world, grief and trouble for worldly losses and disappointments, which laid the foundation on my former affliction. And as much as I love these things, in a time of need, I found they could do nothing for me. Should I then have made my application to them? Friends help me, riches and estates help me, they must have answered me, tis altogether out of our power. And if the Lord does not help thee, whence shall we? It was a pardon of sin, and peace with God, and peace of conscience that I lacked. But this was what these things were no more able to procure for me than I was to contain all the waters of the sea in the hollow of my hand. It was never known that the things of this world could apply a remedy to a wounded conscience. How vile and contemptible did the world seem in my eyes when conscience accused me for sin, and I was under dreadful apprehensions of God's displeasure against me for it. Should any one then have told me of the riches and honors of the world, yea, of crowns and kingdoms, it would have been as impertinent as to have told a man of drawing on a silken stocking to ease the pain, and set the bones of a broken leg. Let others dote upon the world, I see nothing in these earthly things to commend them to my love. May I love God above all, and enjoy a sense of his love to my soul, and I shall have enough, yea, more than if I did enjoy the things of this world in the greatest abundance. And I cannot forget when I lie under the terrors of an awakened conscience accusing for sin this was more desirable to me than a thousand worlds number seven live daily with a better world in view there remains a rest for the people of God but it is reserved for the other world and not to be enjoyed in this and indeed it is not fit it should for then they would be ready to say tis good to be here and preferred the land of their pilgrimage before their father's house in heaven Keep heaven in your eye, and it will draw a veil over all the glory of this lower world. It will show you the evil of sin and the necessity of a holy life, and teach you to shun the one and aspire after the other. Considering the one did fit you for, and the other shut you out of that blessed place, keep in and keep on in the way of your duty, and endeavor to keep up life in your duty, seeing they do all tend to this eternal life. Be sensible of the worth of grace, and be diligent in the use of those means which God has appointed for your growth in grace, seeing it is that which does in some measure qualify you for a future glory, and the troubles you have met with in this world should teach you to mind and prepare for a better. Here is sometimes day and sometimes night, but in heaven it will be all day and no night, and when you are there you will be out of the reach of the devil's fiery darts. You shall neither sin nor be tempted to sin any more forever. There will be no fear, lest God should not love you, or least you should not love God, for there will be nothing to alienate your love from God, or God's from you. What an alteration will there be in the state and condition of the people of God in heaven, from what it was on earth, when they shall love God and be beloved by him. Know that they do love God, and they are the objects of his love, and that nothing shall ever abate their love to him, or hinder their communications of his love to them. Blessed state and place, happy, thrice happy, eternally happy are those who attain it. 
Lord, let me have that faith that may give me the victory over this lower world, and realize to me the invisible things of the world above, as if they were present, that I may daily live in the believing views and forethoughts thereof, and converse in heaven the little time of my pilgrimage here on earth. While the men of this world are coveting earthly things and enlarging their desires after them, let me lay up my treasures in heaven. Let the thoughts, the hopes, the love, and desire of my soul be there. And though there is a Red Sea and a wilderness which I must pass through before I come to the promised land, though I must pass through the valley of the shadow of death before I can partake of the inheritance of the saints and light, let the sense of thy love and the light of thy countenance and a strong love to my dear Redeemer make me overlook the terrors of death and the darkness of a grave, and make me willing to depart and be with Christ who loved me and died for me and washed me from my sins in his blood, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The signs of melancholy. Melancholy persons are commonly exceeding fearful, causelessly, or beyond what there is cause for. Everything which they hear or see is ready to increase their fears, especially if fear was the first cause, as ordinarily it is. Second, their fantasy most errs in aggravating their sin, or dangers, or unhappiness. Every ordinary infirmity they are ready to speak of with amazement as an heinous sin, and every possible danger they take for probable, and every probable one for certain, and every little danger for a great one, and every calamity for an utter undoing. They are still addicted to excess, of sadness, some weeping they know not why, and some thinking it not to be so, and if they should smile or speak merrily, their hearts smite them for it as if they had done amiss. They place most of their religion in sorrowing and austerities to the flesh. They are continually self-accusers, turning all into manner of accusation against themselves, which they hear or read or see or think of, quarreling with themselves for everything they do, as a contentious person does with others. They are still apprehending themselves, forsaken of God and prone to despair. They are just like a man in a wilderness, forsaken of all his friends and comforts, Forlorn and desolate, their continual thought is, I am undone, undone, undone. Whereas they that are most forsaken of God are most willing of their present condition and most love their sin and hate holiness and all that would reform them, and if they have power will persecute them as enemies, which is far enough from being their case. They are still thinking that the day of grace is past and that it is now too late to repent or find mercy. If you tell them of the tenor of the gospel, and offers a free pardon to every penitent believer, they cry out still, Too late, too late, my day is past. Whereas to conclude that, the day of grace is past, and God will never give them grace nor pardon them, while he is daily entreating them to be reconciled to him and accept his grace, is an abusive suspicion that God is not sincere, and a contradiction on a tenor of his word, an instituted ministry, when he bids us go to the highways and hedges and compel even the basest to come in, for a willing soul to suspect that God is unwilling, is abusively to give him the lie. They are oft tempted to gather despairing thoughts from the doctrine of predestination, and to think that if God has reprobated them, or has not elected them, all that they can do, or all that the world can do, cannot save them. And next, they strongly conceit that they are not elected, and so that they are past hope or in help, not knowing that God elects not a man separately or simply to be saved, but conjunctly to believe, repent, and to be saved, and so to the end and means together, and that they all will repent and choose Christ in a holy life, are elected to salvation because they are elected to the means and condition of salvation, which if they preserve they shall enjoy. To repent is the best way to prove that I am elected to repent. They never read or hear of any miserable instance, but they are thinking that this is their case. If they hear of Cain or Pharaoh given up to hardness of heart, or do but read some are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, or do they have eyes and see not, ears and hear not, hearts and understand not, they think, this is all spoken of me, or this is just my case. If they hear of any terrible example of God's judgments on any, they think it will be so with them. If any die suddenly, or a house be burnt, or any be distracted or die in despair, they think it will be so with them. 
The reading of Francis Virus' case causes or increases melancholy in many. The ignorant author, having described a plain melancholy contracted by the trouble of sinning against conscience, as if it were a damnable despair of a sound understanding. And yet they think that never any was as they are. I have had abundance in a few weeks with me, almost just in the same case, and yet every one saith, never any one was as they. They are utterly unable to rejoice in anything. They cannot apprehend, believe, or think of anything that is comfortable to them. They read all the threatenings of the word with quick sense and application, but the promises they read over and over without taking notice of them as if they had not read them, or else they say they do not belong to me. The greater the mercy of God is, and the riches of his grace, the more miserable am I that I have no part in them. They are like a man in continual pain or sickness. They cannot rejoice, because the feeling of his pain forbids him. They look on husband, wife, friends, children, house, goods, and all without any comfort, as one would do that is going to be executed for some crime. Their consciences are quick in telling them of sin, and putting them upon any dejection as a duty. But they are dead to all duties that tend to consolation, as to thanksgiving for mercies, praises of God, meditating on his love and grace and Christ and promises. Put them never so hard on these, and they feel not their duty, nor make any conscience of it, but think it is a duty for others, but unsuitable to them. They always say that they cannot believe, and therefore think they cannot be saved, because that commonly they mistake the nature of faith, and take it to be a believing that they themselves are forgiven and in favor with God, and shall be saved. And because they cannot believe this, which then disease will not suffer them to believe, therefore they think they are no believers. Whereas saving faith is nothing but such a belief that the gospel is true, and Christ the Savior of the world, as causes our wills to consent that he is ours, and that we are his, and so to subscribe the covenant of grace. And while they thus consent and would give a world to be sure that Christ were theirs and to be perfectly holy, yet they think they believe not because they believe not that he will forgive or save them. They are still displeased and discomfited with themselves, just as a peevish, froward person is apt to be with others. See one that is hard to be pleased and is finding fault with everything that they see or hear, and offended at every one that comes in their way, and suspicious of every body that they see whispering. And just so is a melancholy person against himself, suspecting, displeased, and finding fault with all. They are much addicted to solitariness and weary of company for the most part. They are given up to a fixed musings and long pouring thoughts to little purpose, so that deep musings and thinking are their chief employments and much of their disease. They are much averse to the labors of their callings and given to idleness, either to lie in beds or to sit unprofitably by themselves. Their thoughts are most upon themselves, like the millstones that grind on themselves when they have no caress. So one thought begets another. Their thoughts are taken up about their thoughts. When they have thought irregularly, they think again what they have been thinking on. They meditate not much on God, unless on his wrath, nor heaven, nor Christ, nor the state of the church, nor anything without them ordinarily, but all their thoughts are contracted and turned inwards on themselves. Self-troubling is the sum of their thoughts and lives. Would they but seek after God in themselves, and see his grace and benefits that were the better? But poor souls in the darkness of temptation, they overlook their God, and most of them study of themselves, to see Satan and his workings in themselves, to find as much of his image as they can in the deformities or infirmities of their souls. But the image of God they overlook and hardly will acknowledge. And so as noble objects raise the soul, and amiable objects kindle love, and comfortable objects fill it with delight, and God, who is all in one perfection, does elevate and perfect it and make it happy, so inferior objects do depress it, and ugly, loathsome objects fill it with distaste and loathing, and sad and mournful objects turn it into grief, and therefore to be still looking on their miseries and deformities must needs turn calamity and woe into the temperament and complexion of the soul. Their thoughts are all perplexed like rabbled yarn or silk, or like a man in a maze and wilderness, or that has lost himself in his way in the night. He is pouring and groping about, and can make little of anything, but is bewildered and entangled the more, full of doubts and difficulties, out of which he cannot find the way. 
They are endless in their scruples, afraid lest they sin in every word they speak, and in every thought, and every look, and every meal they eat, and all the clothes they wear. And if they think to amend them, they are still scrupling their supposed amendments. They dare neither travail nor stay at home, neither speak nor be silent, but they are scrupling all as if they were wholly composed of self-perplexing scruples. Hence it comes to pass that they are greatly addicted to superstition, to make many laws to themselves that God never made them, and to ensnare themselves with needless vows and resolutions and hurtful austerities, touch not, taste not, handle not, and to place their religion much in such outward self-imposed task, to spend so many hours in this or that act of devotion, to wear such cloths, and forbear other that are fitter, to forbear all diet that pleases the appetite with much of the like. A great deal of the perfection of popish devotion proceeds from melancholy, though their government come from pride and covetousness. They have lost the power of governing their thoughts by reason, so that if you convince them that they should cast out their self-perplexing unprofitable thoughts, and turn their thoughts to other subjects, or be vacant, they are not able to obey you. They seem to be under a necessity or constraint. They cannot turn away their minds. They cannot think of love and mercy. They can think of nothing but what they do think of. No more than a man in a toothache can forbear to think of his pain. They usually grow hence to a disability to any private prayer or meditation. Their thoughts are presently cast all into a confusion when they should pray or meditate. They scatter abroad in a hundred ways, and they can't keep them upon anything, for this is the very point of their disease, a distempered, confused fantasy with a weak reason which cannot govern it. Sometimes terror drives them from prayer. They dare not hope, and therefore dare not pray, and usually they dare not receive the Lord's Supper. Here they are fearfulest of all. And if they do receive it, they are cast down with tears, fearing that they have taken their own damnation by receiving it unworthily. Hence they grow to a great aversion to all holy duty. Fear and despair make them go to prayer, hearing, reading, as a bear to the stake. And then they think that they are haters of God and godliness, imputing the effects of their disease to their souls, when it Yet at the same time, those of them that are godly would rather be free from all their sins and be perfectly holy than have all the riches or honor in the world. Objection. But I find in myself so great an unwillingness to prayer, meditation, and every holy duty, as gives me just cause to fear that I am one among the number of the ungodly. Answer. Number one. Is your unwillingness to believe and trust God and love Him perfectly and to live in His thankful, joyful praises and to love His word and ways and servants, and that forever, greater than your willingness and desire? It is these inward acts that are the holiness of the soul, and to be willing of these is to be willing to be holy. Number two, as to outward exercises by praying and such like, there may be some such disturbance of the spirits raised by them through temptations and false thoughts and fears has put the mind into renewed trouble, and the duty that many are against, rather than the duty itself. And such may find that at the same time they would fain have that calmness, confidence, and delight in God, which they would be glad to express by holy prayer. And we must distinguish between a degree of unwillingness or backwardness, which is predominant and effectual, and a degree which does but strive against holiness, but not overcome. Every Christian has flesh, which lusts against the spirit, and would draw back, and therefore has some degree of backwardness to his duty. But if this did prevail, he would give it over, which he does not. And yet for a time in temptation and melancholy, he may be deterred from some outward duty and give it over, and yet not lose a holy state of soul. Many a true Christian is many years affrighted from the Lord's Supper, and some such persons in deep melancholy and temptations have given over outward prayer and hearing sermons and reading, and yet have not given over a desire of holiness which is heart prayer, nor a desire to love and obey God's word. Sick men cease outward duty in their beds when they cease not inward piety. They are usually so taken up with busy and earnest thoughts, which being perplexed do but strive with themselves and contradict one another, that they feel it just as if something were speaking with them, 
and all their own violent thoughts were the pleadings and impulse of some other, and therefore they are wont to impute all their fantasies either to some extraordinary acting of the devil, or to some extraordinary motions of the Spirit of God, and they are used to express themselves in such words as these, It was said upon my heart, or it was said to me that I must do thus and thus, and then it was said that I must not do this or that, and I was told that I must do so or so. And they think that their imagination is something talking in them and saying to them all that they are thinking. When melancholy grows strong, they are almost always troubled with hideous blasphemous temptations against God or Christ or the scripture, and against the immortality of the soul, which comes partly from their own fears, which make them think most against their will of that what they are most afraid of thinking, as the spirit and blood will have recourse to the part which is hurt, the very pain of their fears does draw their thoughts to what they fear, as he that is over desirous to sleep and afraid lest he shall not sleep is sure to wake because his fears and desires keep him waking, so do the fears and desires of the melancholy cross themselves, and with all the malice of the devil plainly here interposes and takes advantage by this disease to tempt and trouble them, and to show his hatred to God and Christ and scriptures and to them, for as he can much easier tempt a choleric person to anger than another, and a phlegmatic fleshly person to sloth, and a sanguine or hot-tempered person to lust and wantonness, so also a melancholy person to thoughts of blasphemy, and fidelity and despair. And oftentimes they feel a vehement urgency, as if something within them urged them to speak such a blasphemous or foolish word, and they can have no rest unless they yield in this or other such cases to what they are urged to, and some are ready to yield to a temptation to be quiet. And when they have done, they are tempted utterly to despair, because they have committed so great a sin. And when the devil has got this advantage of them, he is still setting it before them. Hereupon they are further tempted to think they have committed a sin against the Holy Ghost, which is no other than an aggravated non-performance and refusal of the condition of the covenant, namely when infidels are so obstinate in their infidelity that they will rather impute the miracles of the Holy Ghost to the devil, than they will be convinced by them that Christ is the true Messiah or Savior. This is the true nature of the sin against the Holy Ghost, so that no one is guilty of this sin against the Holy Ghost who confesses that Jesus is the Christ and Savior, or that confesses the miracles done by Christ and his apostles were done by the Holy Ghost, or that the confession of the gospel is true, or that does not justify his infidelity. He must be a professed infidel against confessed miracles that commits this sin, and yet many despair because they fear they have committed this sin that never understood what it is, nor have any reason but bare fear, and some blasphemous temptations which they abhor to make them imagine that this sin is theirs, and that they shall not be forgiven, not considering that a temptation is one thing and a sin another, and that no man has less cause to fear being condemned for his sin than he that is least willing of it and most hates it. And no man can be less willing of any sin than these poor souls are of the hideous blasphemous thoughts which they complain of. Hereupon some of them grow to think that they are possessed of devils, and if it does but enter into their fantasy how possessed persons used to act, the very strength of imagination will make them do so too, so that I have known those will swear and curse and blaspheme, and imitate an inward alien voice, thinking themselves that it is the devil in them that does all this. It is the devil's way to haunt those with troubling temptations whom he cannot overcome with alluring and damning temptations, as he raises storms of persecution against them without, as soon as they are escaping from his deceits, so does he trouble them within as far as God permits him. We don't deny but Satan has a great hand in the case of such melancholy persons, for his temptations cause the sin which God corrects them for. His execution usually is the cause of the distempers of the body, and as a temper he is the cause of the sinful and troublesome thoughts and doubts and fears and passions which the melancholy causes. The devil cannot do what he will with us, but what we give him the advantage to do. He cannot break open our doors, but he can enter if we leave them open. He can easily tempt a heavy phlegmatic body to sloth, a weak and choleric person 
to anger, a strong and sanguine person to lust, and one of a strong appetite to gluttony or to drunkenness, and vain sportful youth to idle plays and gaming and voluptuousness, when to others such temptations would have small strength. And so if he can cast persons into melancholy, he can easily tempt them to overmuch fear and sorrow, and to distracting doubts and thoughts, and to murmur against God and to despair. But God will impute his mere temptations to the devil himself, and not to the melancholy person, as long as they receive them not by the will, but hate them. Nor will he condemn them for those ill effects which are unavoidable from the power of a bodily disease, any more than he will condemn a man for raving thoughts or words in a fever, frenzy, or utter madness. But so far as reason yet has power and the will can govern the passions, it is their fault if they use not the power, though the difficulty make the fault the less. So melancholy persons that are near distraction verily think that they hear voices and see lights and apparitions, that the curtains are opened on them, that something meets them and saith this or that to them, when all is but the error of a crazed brain and a sick imagination. Many of them are weary of their lives through the constant tiring perplexity of their minds. Some of them resolutely famish themselves. Some are strongly tempted to murder themselves. And they are haunted with the temptation so restlessly that they can go on, that they can go on no further, but they feel as if somewhat within them put them on and said, Do it. For the disease they labor under will let them feel nothing but misery and despair and say nothing, but I am forsaken, miserable, and undone. And not only makes them weary of their lives, even while they are afraid to die, but the devil has some great advantage by it to urge them to do it, so that if they pass over a bridge, he urges them to leap into the water. If they see a knife, they are presently urged to kill themselves with it, and feel as if it were something within them, importunately provoking them and saying, Do it, do it now, and giving them no rest and so much that many of them contrive it and cast about secretly how they may accomplish it, yea, so far yield to the temptation as to make away themselves. Though the cure of these poor people belong as much to others' care as to their own, yet so far as they yet can use their reason, they must be warned, number one, to abhor all these suggestions and give them not room a moment in their minds. Number two, and to avoid all occasions of the sin, and not to be near a knife a river, or any instrument which the devil would have them use in execution. And number three, to open their case to others and tell them all that they may help to their preservation. Many of them are restlessly vexed with fears of want and poverty and misery to their families, and of imprisonment or banishment, unless somebody will kill them, and every one they see whispering they think is plotting to take away their lives. Some of them lay a law upon themselves that they will not speak and so live long in a resolute silence. All of them are intractable and stiff in their own conceits and hardly persuaded out of them, be they never so irrational. Few of them are the better for any reason, conviction, or counsel that is given them. If you convince them of some work of the Spirit upon their souls, and a little at present abate their sadness, yet as soon as they are gone home and look again upon their souls through their perturbing humors, all your convincing arguments are forgotten, and they are as far from comfort as ever they were. All the good thoughts of their estate which you can possibly help them to are seldom above a day or two old. Yet in all this distemper few of them will believe that they are melancholy, but abhor to hear men tell them so, and say it is but the rational sense of their unhappiness, and of the forsakings and heavy wrath of God, and therefore they are hardly persuaded to take any physic or use any means for the cure of their bodies, saying they are well, and being confident that it is only their souls that are distressed. This is a miserable case of these poor people to be pitied, and not to be despised by any. I have spoken nothing but what I have often seen and known, and let none despise such. For men of all sorts do fall into this misery, learned and unlearned, high and low, good and bad, yea, some that have lived in the greatest jollity and sensuality, when God has made them feel their folly. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, 
including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.